Heartland Flags and Gifts presents Legends and Listeners with Scott Docterman and Chad Leistico. Fly them high and fly them proud. Find your flag at heartlandflags.com. Breaking down the Big Ten from the Channel Seat Studios, this is Iowa Everywhere. What is up, Hawkeye fans, Big Ten fans, and Iowans everywhere? Welcome into episode two of Legends and Listeners here on the Iowa Everywhere Network. My name is Chad Leistico, and I have covered the Iowa Hawkeyes for quite a while at the Des Moines Register. Mm -hmm. and And I am elated once again to be joining you from the Channel Seed Studios and excited to be joined by my cohort and competitor on the Hawkeyes beat, Scott Docterman of The Athletic. Scott, uh, reception for episode one of Le- Legends and Listeners was pretty awesome, pretty humbling. Uh, kind of feels like the bar is high for our second episode on this Monday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it should be. So I guess we're going to have to really uh, hone in on our skills here. Um, I I would say for the most part, um, you know, I was pretty happy with the way things were discussed. And we've got we've got a pretty good show coming up, too. You put together a really good lineup, and I think we've got a lot of good ideas and thoughts and things to discuss, as always. I want to remind you that Legends and Listeners is brought to you each week by Heartland Flags and Gifts. Now is the time to acquire your tailgating gear or that brand new uh, Hawkeye flag to attach to your flagpole out, out in the front yard. Uh, Heartland Flags and Gifts provides free shipping anywhere in the U.S., also delivers new products constantly, and has you covered with nearly every team, every sport, and every flag. Visit our friends at heartlandflags.com or in-store at 3719 Southwest 9th Street in Des Moines. All right, Scott, I just want to remind folks, as we kind of outlined last week on our show, uh, our kind of the format we have in our mind is to kind of hit a few appetizer topics before diving into our main course of the day. We got a pretty fun entree, I feel like, this afternoon. Uh, today, we decided to start with the continuing news of the week, which is kind of Iowa's quarterback situation. The Hawkeyes and Cade McNamara were featured on the Big Ten Network training camp show on Friday. Scott, uh, given what we saw then and kind of what you're hearing, how do you feel about the QB one situation at this point? I would say I'd feel good. I, I mean, you know, it's still two weeks, you know, 12 days before kickoff. And when you're dealing with a quad, I think a quad is better than a, than a hamstring uh, because hamstrings can be a little more, di- a little bit, you know, limiting, I would say. Um, and, you know, we saw him with a compression sleeve on. I, I imagine right now it's about just healing up. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an injury when you're dealing with muscles, those are injuries that just really, they can linger if you allow them to linger. But if you get used to, you know, the training that at some point it just kind of works its way through it. The good thing is he didn't have to play on Saturday. He doesn't have to play this Saturday. So overall, I feel pretty secure in thinking he's probably going to play week one. I would put him if it was an NFL injury report, probable, Um, you know, I wouldn't gamble on it especially if I was a player, but <laughs> I do think that that's, that's where I would put him. What do you think, Chad? Yeah. I mean, I was sort of like, I don't know, like, I know it's part of the deal, but like, I feel like we got so many questions like, where's Cade? Why isn't he practicing? What's going on? Like, it's literally the smartest thing in the world to do. If you have a, you know, a muscle injury is to rest it. I mean, there's no point in having him out there, you know, wheeling passes around the practice field, potentially getting hurt again. I mean, we see this, heck, we see this in, uh, you know, our preseason games, you know, for the Bears or whatever, you know, they're sitting all their main guys. They they want to get them to week one, right? So that's kind of the idea here, I think, for the Hawkeyes. Now, I, I've heard the same. Like, it's not necessarily – it could be a little touch and go for week one, but I know Cade McNamara has played through broken ribs before in games, and uh, he's a tough guy. He's a competitor, like the ultimate competitor. That's why Kirk Ferentz wants him there. He likes likes him there. Uh, and, I mean, I, I would be very surprised if Cade is not playing in week one. Now, the question is, Scott, is he going to be, you know, 100% able to do everything he needs to? Uh, I guess that remains to be seen. I, here's a question for you. Do you think – that Cade will be there next Tuesday when we 
have our first game week media availability. To me, that'll be a little bit of an interesting barometer. That's a good question. And I'm only guessing as opposed to having any kind of real knowledge, but I, I think he will be because I think I don't, I don't see him shying away from it. I, I see him a lot like Spencer. Spencer had no problem, you know, coming out, talking to us, whether they played poorly or even worse. And uh, whether he was hurt or not, I think there was one week where he got the week off where it was just mainly SID saying, you know what, he's not going to be around. So, you know, that that was fine. You know, and I, I think Cade's built the same way. Very accountable, wants to say the right thing. He's probably going to say, you know what, I'm fine. I'm, you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it hurt a little bit, but I'm OK. And that's pretty much par for the course when you're dealing with football players that they're always fine. And, and I remember not being fine myself. And that was a million years ago. So I know exactly what they're dealing with. So I don't know. What do you think? You think he's going to be there or you think that he's going to hide? You know, I feel like, I mean, just like with Noah Shannon, right, at, at Iowa Football Media Day, like, you know, do you want to talk or do you not to the media? They might give him that option potentially, you know, if he's, um, you know, and it might depend on how he's feeling too. Uh, you know, that they've had days where, you know, hey, he's he's with the trainer today, Might he's only got five minutes or something like that. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a day like that. Uh, but I, I would expect him to be top of the depth chart. I just hope we don't, you know, I don't want to get to the point where it's Tuesday and it's like Kirk Ferentz is like being coy about, you know, whether he's going to be back or not. I just don't think that that's productive. Um, you know, tell if he's going to play, tell if he's going to play or not. And then, you know, what the status is. I mean, it's, you know, he said it's a whole new world, right? With the gambling mm. stuff, you know, let's not, let's not get people poking around your program, looking for info, just come out with the info. That's, that's kind of where I stand on, on all this stuff. But uh, yeah. do you have anything else on that topic? Anything else from the BTN show that stood out to you at all? Not a lot. You more, mean you're more annoyances. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're really what you're just trying to do with, with the BTN is because we get such a limited availability. And it, it makes me insanely jealous, you know, at The Athletic when we have Mitch Sherman covers Nebraska and especially Jesse Temple covers Wisconsin and like practically every practice is open and, and we get one opportunity and we know that it's going to be the most vanilla of the practices in August. And, and, you know, they can't even, <laughs> we don't even have a, uh, photos anymore, photo galleries. And so we can't even play that guessing game. So it's really, I always call it paranoia season because you're worried to death that somebody else knows something or you're trying to guess or, you know, and the worst part for us is Chad, when you're trying to write something, you don't want to be writing something and it's all of a sudden, Oh yeah. Yesterday he got hurt and then he's not going to play. And then all of a sudden you're like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, then you look like an idiot and that's where we are right now. So um, crossing my fingers, nothing major happens before we start writing a few more of our features this week. Um, but from the big 10 network show, I don't really see any, I didn't see anything that made me jump out of my seat and go, okay, I need to write that. Yeah. Uh, sounds like Cooper DeGene and Noah Shannon are back at practice. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's positive, I think, at least for their health and, and whatnot. Well, obviously Noah's a different situation. We'll get to him later. But uh, also on our appetizer menu today is Beth Getz, Scott. Uh, as we kind of teased on last week's debut of Legends and Listeners, uh, Iowa's interim athletics director, Beth Getz, was set to meet the media for the first time in that role, and she did so on Thursday afternoon. Uh, this was not our first interaction with her, but mm. it really was the first time Iowa fans everywhere could kind of watch her take questions and kind of hear what she has to say from the top chair in Iowa athletics. Scott, how did you feel like she came across? Well, if, if uh, on a scale of one to 10 and 10 being high, I thought she was a 10. I thought she did outstanding. I thought she came across so on top of every issue and in command of every issue and just felt like, you know, she had, you know, she's like been training for this for her whole life. And, and she knew every topic, she had good answers for it all. I, I feel like, you know, and I was very, very confident in her anyway, you know, going into this, you know, when she got hired, I went, okay, this is a really smart hire. This was like when Iowa hired Gene Taylor to be the deputy a few years ago. And, and then of course he's at Kansas state and, you know, and then there've been a few, 
eh, probably more on the chauvinist side of things. Oh, we want to open things up. And I think the big fear is, oh, my God, you know, a woman can't hire a football coach. Right. You know, but I think she'll be all right doing that. And, and uh, so I, overall, I was very, very impressed by her message, her thoughts, how she conveyed them. I think Iowa's got uh, the next in line of, of a great administrator if it chooses to go that direction. And I think if they don't, somebody else will and they'll lose out. So um, I came away very, very impressed. And, and I don't know what your thoughts are, Chad. I wrote it and, you know, had people come come after me a little bit. But um, I do think she's going to be um, she's she's going to be one of the major voices in the country. And Iowa has always been a great place to cultivate those from Christine Grant and Bob Bowlesby and, and Bump Elliott. I think uh, this is another opportunity for Iowa to move in that direction. I was really, really impressed um, across the board on every topic. She she not only answered the questions, but had some substance to it. You know, we, even with the gambling. Hey, you know, I, I expect things in the coming days and, you know, we're going to support our athletes uh, on the NIL, on the Sw Iowa Swarm Collective. You know, she was like she had met with Brad Heinrichs already. She she recognized the importance of the Iowa Swarm. And uh, that's something that. You know, her predecessor did not. That was, you know, but she also didn't didn't say like, oh, I'm going to do this instead of yeah. what he did or whatever. But she just letting her actions speak for herself uh, totally comes across to me and everybody you talk to, too, is, is somebody who gets things done. Uh, I did a uh, about a 25 minute segment for our Hawk Central radio show this week uh, with Beth kind of after that press conference, Scott. And uh, I'm really excited for people to hear that. A couple of things that we talked about that I'll, I'm happy to tease here is, number one, the wrestling facility is ahead of schedule. And wrestling was under her, you know, was under Barbara Burke's umbrella, also under hers. Tom Brands is a huge fan of hers. That should tell people mm -hmm. something right there. Uh, Lisa Bluter attended the, the press conference, obviously, as a show of support. And then also mentioned, you know, people always want to know, when are we going to renovate Carver? You know, like, you know, she's on top of that, uh, they're putting out a, they're working on a feasibility story, uh, study, I'm sorry, to, to determine what they can do, what they can't do. And, and I thought she also blended a little bit of humor. Like in our interview, she was like, I know one thing for sure is, uh, we need more ice cream machines, you know, like yeah. little, little lines like that, you know? Uh, so I, I'm really encouraged, um, by everything I heard. I, I I'm not surprised that I'm encouraged. Uh, I just feel like, yeah, she's on top of things. One person who uh, has listened to a lot of Gary Barta over the last 17 years uh, just kind of shared with me, you know, was, you know, it's kind of nice to feel like you're, you know, being told the truth about things and not, not, you're not trying to hide or dance around topics. You're just being told that. And also that this person phrased it to me as a breath of fresh air. So, and this is somebody who's really plugged in to the whole deal at the university. So, uh, I mean, I, I feel like she's got to be the, I mean, he, definitely the front runner to be Iowa athletic director permanently. Uh, I saw Washington's AD uh, mm -hmm. just was uh, you know, hired or going to be hired at USC. So mm -hmm. there's going to be an opening at Washington very soon, <laughs> a big dead yeah. school. Uh, I don't think Iowa would be wise to let her go. And it, no. it seems like she's, I mean, she's a Midwest uh, person you know, grew up in the St. Louis area. It just makes a lot of sense. She's still only 49 years old, a long future ahead. So I, uh, that, that was, I know I'm rambling here, but I just was that impressed with her. I thought, I thought she was great. Yeah, I agree. And plus she's our age, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. For another age, month, yeah. At yeah, least yeah. for another month for me, but, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I thought, I thought very highly of the, what the topic she spoke with. Um, I think she gets it. I think she understands, you know, where, you know, and this is, you know, Gary, you know, there, there were a lot of positives that a lot of people don't want to talk about. There are a lot of negatives, which they do. Yeah. I'm not going to go on that route. But what I'm going to say is that Gary's philosophy was much more conservative uh, when it came to athletics and the direction that it was headed. And uh, I think, you know, whereas Beth and and I'm not speaking from a political ideology. I'm just saying that the direction mm -hmm. of these uh, of the departments, and I think she understands that where the future is, that in three years, it's going to look completely different than what it does now. And certainly what it did eight years ago and whatever. So I think in that situation, you know, whether it's sharing money with with athletes, that's probably going to happen at some point. It's better to just figure out a way to do it and do it well, rather than 
wait for it to be dictated to you. And, and I think she's got a, um, you know, I, I talked to a couple of people around the, uh, the big 10 and they seem to think that she could be, you know, a, a really one of the stronger voices in, in college athletics that, you know, once she gets that opportunity to lead a department and be in those meetings and have that kind of cachet and that stature. And I think, um, you know, just knowing most of the ADs around the big 10, I would say she and Josh Whitman kind of have that charisma and have that approach. And I think, you know, if Iowa wants to be, you know, Iowa's done a really nice job over the last 40 plus years of kind of hitting above its weight and fighting in its weight class and a little bit higher. I think this is another area where you can kind of continue that is, is if you have a great athletic director. And I think she provides that. Good perspective there, Scott. Time now for our central topic of today's show. Last week, we talked about the state of Iowa's offense. This week, we flip sides of the ball, Scott, and focus on this question, which we will try to answer by the end of this conversation, which is this. Will Iowa have the best defense in the Big Ten in 2023? And if we have time, a bonus question, will Iowa have a top 10 defense nationally for the fourth time in six years. Um, I don't know how you want to start this conversation, Scott. I mean, I kind of thought kind of like we did at the offense, maybe go through each position then try to answer it holistically. Or if you want to, we can start in the big 10, like where does Iowa rank coming into the season in your mind? Why don't you just run with it and I'll follow. You know, I guess I'm going to start with what did Iowa do last year and why was it successful? And what are the areas that needs to really shore up? in order to get there again. And I, and let's start with last year. I don't think, I mean, I think people understand how good it was. I don't think they understand necessarily how great it was at 3.99 yards per care or yards per play. It was the best in the big 10 since 2007. And it wasn't just because well, they play in the big 10 West. It was because they also played Michigan and they played Ohio state and, and they played other teams too, that had some competitive offensives and they allowed some big plays in some accidental situations And when you look at what they were second um, overall when it came to scoring defense in the country, um, and one of those games, unfortunately, they gave up 54 points, which wasn't really on them. I mean, when they they get the ball over, what, six times inside the opponent's 40? or or, or They had a bunch of turnovers on downs, too, and they were just going for it, you know. You know, know, punter running, you know, just all kinds of stuff. But – you know, they were first in the country in rushing TDs allowed with four. They were second in points allowed, 13.3, 3.99 yards per play. Stop rate was number one, which my colleague Max Olson really dedicates half of his offseason to running. First in yards per pass allowed. So they were not only great against the run, they were great against the pass. And, um, you know, the only thing that they gave up a little bit more than normal or, the, you know, about average was past completion percentage, but that's the way they play. They're all right with that. They'll, they'll surrender those types of things. You know, so overall, last year was the best statistical year Iowa's had since 81. And even though we get caught up, especially in this state and on this beat with legacy bias, it eats us more so than recency bias does. And if, if I was to say the Iowa 2022 defense was the best since 81 people go what about 04 what about it you know 09 what about 10 no they're better but frankly they were better they were great then too don't get me wrong but and it really starts they had a very good offense their defensive line that an outstanding secondary and then they had the best linebacker they've ever had and i will go argue on that one jack campbell is the best linebacker i was ever had and he could do so many different things and so when you throw that all in together and you look at the way they played you know what was it 10 games it was uh you know or nine games 10 points or less yep. and, and then another one where it was last play of the game right was, northwestern, northwestern yeah yep. so outstanding so for the encore and and then i'll let you talk because i'm rambling here but the the encore it's not going to be what 2022 is i do think it'll be very very good but but i don't know if i can go as far as to say this will be as good as 2022 Great uh, synopsis there, Scott. I think where where I'll take this next is kind of looking at each position group. 
or at least start to, and then maybe at the end we can circle into like, hey, which teams are going to be the best in the Big Ten, and where does Iowa fit into that conversation? And uh, I actually just filed a piece on uh, the defensive line, so let's start there. Okay. Uh, that is that is definitely where I see the strength of this defense. Uh, I feel like a lot of years, a lot of the focus goes to the secondary, but for me, I mean. I don't know what you think, but even lo- losing Lucas Van Ness, who was outstanding, uh, you know, and, and made the most of his 36 ish snaps <laughs> per game, <laughs> uh, was it, and John Wagner, same, th- same category of snap counts type of thing. Uh, losing those two guys is really, you're losing two of your top nine from last year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we know, you know, Noah Shannon, who knows what, what his status will be. We may find out soon, but uh, this is a super strong group. And I was, I, I found out everything I needed to know on kids day when I saw uh, Deontay Craig dominating Aaron Graves, unblockable <laughs> YA black on the field. I mean, he hasn't been yeah, healthy. Right. And then, uh, you know, arguably Scott, two of the stars of the day and Max Llewellyn and Brian Allen. I mean, just looked like yep. fantastic prospects. We'll see how much Kelvin Bell plays them early, but they look like players to me. And uh, you, and then you, I haven't even mentioned Joe Evans yet, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And six-year senior with 18 and a half career sacks. Logan Lee, <laughs> you know, veteran stalwart inside. I mean, uh, this looks like just a really deep, uh, almost like an ideal position group for Kelvin and Jay Neiman because they can rotate bodies and keep guys fresh. And if a guy like Noah Shannon goes down for one week, three weeks, six weeks, whatever for the gambling stuff, I think they'll be fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm there with you on this line. If they had Lucas Van Ness, it, it's unquestionably the best line in the, in the country because I think they're, they're that deep and that strong. Um, not having him is you know, the, then you got other people that need to step up. I'm not sure they have an edge rusher that, that can match him. He is, uh, he was elite. If he would have played more, he would have been more elite, but I digress. I, I think though, when you start to look at specialist, no, I'm just special. Kidding. Oh geez. There we go. <laughs> but I, I think when you look at the depth, that's really what stands out to me because it's not so much who can play and when and where it's, it's, can you go to your seventh, eighth, ninth guy, and can they go in and play at a level comparable to your starters when you need them to? And they can. And I, I guess to me, the strength starts in in the interior, which doesn't happen a whole lot. And 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 when you look at you know Noah Shannon again, you know unpredictable situation today. Maybe we'll know in probably fifteen minutes after this publishes what will happen. <laughs> you know, typical. Exactly. But, yeah. 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 But. Uh, you know, whatever happens to him. But then you start to look, and I think Logan Lee is very underrated. I think he's actually an outstanding player. And, a, and a, you know, I, I haven't seen him on a whole lot of NFL charts or whatever, but I think he's really good. But behind them, I think, is where you've got the talent. And YA Black and Aaron Graves, to me, are NFL guys. Um, YA looks like once he finally can stay healthy, watch out. He can be a dominating force, and we know Aaron Graves will be. Uh, I was on with a with some Badgers people last week, and and I, you know, and I'm like, I don't want to say this, and this is not, I, I know I what you're gonna say. I know I what said, you're gonna but, say. But, you know, he reminds me of JJ Watt and the way he looks. You know, at, at Wisconsin, I kept saying at Wisconsin. I can't get I can't get there with the the pros yet. <laughs> <laughs> but then on the edge, so, I think Deontay Craig is a chance to really take off and be a force. And Joe Evans is, is a guy that gets overlooked a lot, but I think he's right there too. Um, you know, he, you know, he's tied for the team lead in sacks the last two years. And then, and then backing him up, as you said, you know, you have, um, uh, you know, Ethan Burkett, you know, is just a tough Burkett, dude. Yep, yep. Yeah, great. And I think Max llewellyn has got a chance to be, you know, a, a star in the future. And Brian Allen was maybe the MVP of the kids day practices. And I looked at him like, okay, now I see why you really wanted to keep fighting for that guy, uh, you know, and, and wrestle him away from Illinois. So, and then Terry Thompson's there, J- uh, Jeremiah Pittman, you know, they've got depth and what that means they could survive, God forbid, an injury, a suspension, 
And if they're all still relatively healthy in the fourth quarter at, at Camp Randall Stadium, and even though they're going spread, they're deciding, eh, let's run the big guy, you could stop him. <laughs> and so I really like this line. You know, sack wise, I don't know if they can get to 35 again the way they did last year, but I think they can get to at least 30. So there's a lot I like about this defensive line. I think it will keep them in every game, and that includes December and January. Absolutely. I don't I've always felt that if you've got a good defensive line, your your whole defense can be really, really good. Um, I felt like not to bring up the Bears stuff, but we probably will on this show a little bit, but like you know, when Akeem Hicks and Khalil Mack were rolling for, for those Bears teams, man, that was fun to watch just because they could dominate up front so much. And mm-hmm. we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think the one spot where I'm I just want to see is yeah, that that sack production off the edge because uh, Ethan Herkett, you know, has one career sack, <laughs> you yeah. know, Max Llewellyn, none, Brian Allen, none. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joe Evans converted quarterback, really great production over 43 games, but you know, can he take that uh, closer to 10 sacks or is he going to be kind of in that six range again? Yeah. And I, I agree. Deontay Craig could be the guy uh, that could really up that production. We will see uh, now that he gets more snaps. Uh, Mm -hmm. linebacker Scott is obviously the biggest, uh, you know, they lose all three, their top three from last year. If you count Justin Jacobs transferring to Oregon, uh, obviously, you know, you lose the Butkus award winner and kind of getting back to what you said. I I tweeted after the Minnesota game that, uh, you know, Jack Campbell's the best linebacker in Iowa history. And of course I got a lot of Larry station feedback, but I definitely stand by (laughs) What yeah. I said, especially after seeing Jack, uh, what he's doing with the Lions right now. Uh, so huge shoes to fill there. I think Nick Jackson will end up being the middle linebacker in Jay Higgins the week. That's just my prediction, uh, just because I think Nick knows middle so well. I don't know if you want to m- – I know he's going to learn both, but I feel like middle is his home, right, uh, you know, at Virginia, whereas Jay can, can flex all three spots. So – I kind of think those are your two. Um, what what stood out? How about you, Scott? What do you think about you know their depth there? How strong that position group is and whatnot? If I have a concern on the defense, and this is before the NCAA decides to throw down the the gauntlet, um, you know, I, I think it's really my it's really depth at, at linebacker because it's unproven. And even Jay Higgins, for as much as everybody's talked him up, he's only played two hundred snaps last year. I mean, he was clearly, you know, deep and in, in the woods on this one. And and so, you know, we're, we're, the mic and the will are kind of interchangeable to the point where it's not a it's not a big deal. I mean, they do. Sometimes they take over the middle. Sometimes they play. It's just it's more of a it's a four two five anyway. So I'm not as concerned with where um, Jackson ends up. You know, it's, it's really about calling the, the game and executing when you're in there. Um my concern is, though, clearly what happens if somebody gets hurt. It what happens if somebody has a high ankle sprain or whatever. That concerns me about this unit because now Kyler Fisher is number three, probably their Leo if they start out that way. That's what Seth said. Um, and he's probably also their next guy in, you know, at, at weak side, for instance, if it's Jay that gets hurt or steps out. Then Kyler Fisher walks in at the will, and then Jackson takes over the, the mic. Um, and then, then they've got just a bunch of guys. And some of them have, have risen, and some of them have gotten a little bit better. But you just wonder what happens if. And Jackson Rexroth has probably been their next guy in line that's done a nice job. Jaden Harrell has. He's done a nice job. And, and Carson Shire, if he can ever get healthy, would be – you know, as a guy that's probably their next guy in, he might even ball up to third, but he's not there. And the other guys are green and, you know, Zach tweet and Ben Keeter. We can talk about Ben Keeter at city high, killing people and stuff. I mean, uh, on the field, of course, no, Matt, <laughs> not, not, yeah. not literally. Yeah. We don't not literally, a, we don't need a meme or uh, whatever. On that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But what happens if, and I don't know, and they probably don't know yet either because they're going to have to get tested at some point. And God forbid you're at happy Valley and a whiteout and everybody's singing seven nation army mm-hmm. a thousand times. And, and all <laughs> of a sudden you're trying to call, you know, something you're, Oh, <laughs> and then next thing you know, you've got a rookie in there calling plays, you know, that's going to be tough. So I, I think, uh, 
that to me, if, if I have a concern, it's that because it wasn't that long ago, Chad, I think it was what, 2018 where they, and 2020 early where they had some real issues there and they had a great defense, but it cost them a couple of games because they just didn't have the, the, the piece. I think Jack Hockaday was pretty good, but it took him time and he got hurt and got tossed for right. a game. And, and so they, they really had, and that's my fear for this defense. No, uh, really well put, Scott. Uh, I do want to remind folks that Circa Sports is the exclusive sports betting app of Iowa. Everywhere Circa Sports is sports betting the way it should be, with the highest limits, lowest holds, and best odds. Download the app today at the App Store or CircaSports.com. Scott, this morning when I checked, uh, Iowa was minus 24 for its opener against Utah State with the over-under of 43, which kind of goes well with our defensive discussion here, uh, you know, that this is expected to be a really good defensive team. So let's move to the secondary really quick. Cause I want to wrap up with some big 10 talk here, but yeah, like you said, I mean, we'll see if there's any uh, gambling related suspensions back there at this point, you know, nothing, nothing is out on that, but it's not a real deep group as it is. So you got Cooper DeGene, obviously proven first team AP all America uh, this morning uh, preseason. Uh, Quinn Schulte, you know, has been very, very solid. Uh, Sebastian Castro looks like he's he's just fine at cash. But Xavier Wamp has one career start. I mean, he only had a handful of defensive snaps before that uh, Kentucky game last year. And then we don't know what's going to happen at the other corner. Jamari Harris, he's been out a year. Looked good in the kids' day scrimmage. I like those five as a starting point, but the depth is super concerning there. I mean – I, I think Deshaun Lee is going to be really good. I think TJ Hall might be all right. But, man, you're you're very, very close to, you know, from a suspension or an injury away from real big questions against some real big games, you know, early in the year. This is where things like the transfer portal can hurt a team like Iowa, although I think overall it's been a clear net positive. I mean, they have starters everywhere because of the portal but it strips away a little bit of your depth. And, and this is where somebody, um, you know, they, nobody wants to come to Iowa to be the, the first backup corner. They want to go somewhere and start. And so you've got to make sure that, you know, your depth is decent there and then you get an injury or a suspension. Ooh, you know, what, what happens there now? Um, the couple of the players that I've watched and I thought on kids day were, were okay. I know I'm not going to, I'd say I was less concerned about the depth there than maybe a linebacker. I know that sounds strange, but I thought Deshaun Lee was very, very good for being a redshirt freshman. Uh, that, I think TJ Hall, who is their number three corner at this point, um, looked the part. Um, and then, you know, Brennan Diaz Fernandez was out all last year and he was a second team guy in the spring. And I thought I saw him play a lot more cash, I think. And, and so I, overall, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's not, that's not bad. And um, I, I agree with you about Xavier Wampa. I think, you know, when it comes to athletic ability, he's outstanding. There's no question. And can he be this year what Cooper DeGene was last year? Yeah, I think he can. Um, but he's going to have some growing pains. And he's probably going to get beat a couple of times, maybe even early. Somebody's going to throw it over his head. And he's going to tackle a guy for a 35-yard gain and he's gonna have phil yelling at him and then he's then he's gonna come back then we'll see what he's made of because then if it's a jack tri stadium the place is going crazy then then he's come back and have the tfl then he doesn't come back break up a pass or an interception that's what we want to see from xavier wampa quinn schulte when he's out there um is the most underrated player on the field he do can freaking hit and he's really good at coverage and he's um he's fast too yeah. he's one of the faster guys on the team yeah. So I, and then the backups, you know, I, I, and I also like Cohen Entringer. I think he's going to be a really good player. The, the question is though, Chad, and this is probably the same with you, those three guys hall, you know, they all came in last year Entringer hall and, and Lee, are they a year away or can they step in and then compete and play winning football this year? That's going to be the big question because I kind of have a feeling they're going to be forced into that role at some point. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to, to see, you know, how this all unfolds. Um, I, one thing I like about this group is if you can't, let's say you can get, let's say Deshaun Lee's really good. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say Jamari Harris is great from the start. If you have any issues at safety, potentially, 
could you move? You could easily move Sebastian Castro back to one of the safety spots and put Cooper DeGene at cash, which is his favorite position where he can probably do the most damage. If I mean, that would be a huge luxury for Iowa. Uh, obviously, you have to to have a full trust in that other cornerback, but there is potential, I think, there to kind of have kind of almost your best six yeah. type thing and just move guys around. Uh, now, we'll see. Maybe they need a best seven or something like that. But uh, it is uh, – that secondary is going to be interesting. And one, let's get into the – we're running a little bit low on time here, Scott, so let's get into the Big Ten conversation. One of the reasons I think Iowa could be the best defense in the Big Ten and arguably is, uh, is because of the takeaways factor, right? Uh, you know, Not only are the yardage stats that you cited really good, I mean, the yards per play, great. Uh, I, kind of, I kind of look at 2018 as sort of the – the modern era of the Iowa defense when they yeah. switched to the four, two, five. And you look at those years, year by year, total defense, which they don't even necessarily measure that as the top thing, but total defense, seventh, 17th, eighth, 16th, second in total defense. So three top 10 defenses in there. I think they're probably in that neighborhood to be a fourth. We'll see. Uh, as we know, yards, isn't the number one barometer for Iowa points are, but, uh, I think I was right there for the Big Ten. Now, I saw ESPN. I, they had a preseason article that ranked Michigan as the number two defense in the country and Penn State as four. I think Illinois' defense is fantastic. I mean, talk about takeaways. They had 31 of them last year. Uh, Jerzon Newton, I think I'm pronouncing that right, outstanding defensive tackle. They should have a great defensive line. I think that defense is right in the conversation. I would say those are the – Top four defenses for me. I think Minnesota probably takes a step back uh, defensively after losing some key guys. But uh, I think Michigan, Penn State, Iowa, Illinois, right there in the conversation. Where would you put Iowa uh, among the tops in the Big Ten? I would put them somewhere between one and two. Um, I I think Illinois takes a step back. They had the best secondary, one of the better secondaries I've ever seen. And Devin yeah. Witherspoon was outstanding. Sidney Brown was great. Um you know, they, they had some real players and that they're going to miss those guys. I mean, they, they can replace them and, and Brett's going to have a good defense. He's going to have a good defense every year now. Um, their defensive tackle tandem is right there with Iowa's, if not even a little bit better with Keith Randolph and and they, Johnny, even though it's Jerzon Newton, it's uh, Johnny Newton is what they call him. I think that could, that's going to be very difficult for everybody to run against it, you know, interior wise. And, and so I think they're going to be very competitive, but I put them at four. I put Michigan at three. I think Michigan's got a lot of really good players coming back. No question. And they're, they're going to be, um, you know, among the best in the country again, I, I want to see him take, you know, have a few more TFLs, a few more sacks. So I, I just, I think that they're, they're going to, again, same type of deal as, as Iowa at this point. Um, between Iowa and Penn State is where I'm leaning. And I think Penn State might have more talent on its defense. Its linebacking core may be as good as it's been since the old days um, when they were linebacker U. They've got a great secondary and outstanding front line. It's going to be a very difficult game in Happy Valley for everybody, not just Iowa. So I think this is the best one by far that James Franklin's had. So I would probably put Penn State one, Iowa two. Um, but, you know, that said, Iowa can compete with anybody in that position. It's just can they be healthy enough to not lose guys? Because that's where that's where the biggest problem is yep. between Iowa and the, and the other ones is depth. I mean, you know, when, when Iowa loses a guy like – you know, let's say one of the two middle guys, you know, tweaks his ankle and he's out for the rest of the game. They're bringing in somebody who, d who does not, has never played. Uh, right. Penn State brings in a four star, you know, something right. like that. Right. Yeah. No, I think I'm with you. I was going to put Iowa kind of in that two range. Um, I, I thought Michigan was a little overrated in that ESPN article, but uh, I think I'm with you on, on Penn State. Um, they just got some dudes. I mean, they, <laughs> they've got players, uh, they yes. got a first team All American corner. Uh, on the AP team as well, and Kalen King. So, um, you know, they've got edge guys. So it's uh, that's that's going to be a really fun game in, in week four. So on the record, Iowa everywhere, legends and listeners say Iowa's uh, got the second best defense in the Big Ten this year. We'll see if uh, the Hawkeyes can, you know, show us up here and be number one, right? Um, yeah. Let's go to our let's go to our finishing topics. Great conversation there, Scott. Uh, 
we kind of decided we would try to come up with a, a breakout performer uh, for the Hawkeyes this year uh, on offense and defense. Uh, I know we got to run quickly here. Kind of the uh, the task here is to pick somebody who didn't start last year. So we're going to try to pick somebody who maybe didn't start for the Hawkeyes. Not going to count transfers, obviously. But um, And then maybe we'll find like a guy deep in the weeds who might be a star this year. So I'll let you go first, even though I think you're going to take my answer. Go ahead. <laughs> I've got a couple in my head, but uh, I'm going to go on the defensive side of the ball. and I'm going to go with big number 94. I'm going to go with YA Black. I think he can be a game wrecker, a, a team wrecker. He has the potential to be a breakout performer. Um, built the way he is with that kind of quickness and that kind of power and strength. Um, when he's playing two gap, I don't know that he'll be able to, he's not going to lose much ground if he's healthy. So, you know, he's been kind of that again, injured, you know, broke a foot last year in the opener and then came back against Ohio state really wasn't healthy all year. I like him. I think, you know, he, you know, he's been more of a rotational guy throughout his career, but I think he could be a standout this year. And, uh, it wouldn't surprise me again if, uh, if I'm at the combine next March or late February and all of a sudden it's like, why did that guy not start at Iowa? And, 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 but, uh, all right, I'll kick it over to you. Deontay Craig. He's my, uh, he didn't start last year, so he qualifies. Right. So even though he had good production, I think, yeah. I honestly think he could be maybe a 10 sack guy type deal this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he's just really, really good. And you could see if you look at the snap counts from last year, yeah. He, it just gradually increased as the season went on. And, I mean, heck, he blocked that punt. What was that again? Was that against Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Yeah. And uh, he had he had the fumble recovery, right, at Minnesota after Jack Campbell jarred it loose. So, you know, he also is making big plays. So, yeah. uh, Deontay Craig will be my guy. Let's go to offense, Scott. I guess let's include transfers because most of the offense is, tra- is transfers. But you just can't say McNamara. So, what – what uh, who do you got on offense? Oh my, this is where it gets tough. I mean, since we're not going with starters, and you know the starters are almost under the radar too. But <laughs> yeah, I, true. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Seth Anderson. Yeah, um, good one. Mm-hmm. I think um, based on what we saw in Kids Day, that you know he was a guy we really didn't know much about. I mean, we, when he came, everybody's like, "Wow, this is great! New wide receiver. It's like a new toy." You know, it's yeah. like, Oh, somebody different. You know, it's great. <laughs> uh, you know, his dad was Flipper Anderson. I do remember Flipper Anderson. I probably had his football card back in the day. But 336 yards against the when he was with the Rams against the Chiefs, so it's still an NFL record. But you know, and then in the spring, crickets. You know, injured, mm-hmm. and you're like, ah, oh, but then they got Caleb Brown, and he's a shinier, newer toy. So and then we forget about Seth Anderson, and then we see him, and we're like, okay, this guy's not bad. And and if he becomes somewhat of a threat, and I think it really comes down to the key for me on offense is offensive line play. But if he can produce, uh, if, if the offensive line can block adequately, run block, Seth Anderson will make 20 catches, three or four touchdowns, and be a difference maker in maybe one to two games to where he elevates this for team. I'm really interested to see who their who their best wide receiver is going to be this year. I think Nico is probably your, your front runner for – maybe receptions, but like who can be that, that guy that they split out wide and trying to draw double coverage. I think Vines is possible. I think Anderson's possible. I think Caleb Brown's possible. I like, I like what I saw out of all three of those guys. Um, I really want to pick a returning starter, honestly, but uh, I won't. I, I kind of, just cause I think he had such a bad year last year. Uh, Logan Jones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if he counts as a breakout just where he just takes that big jump, but that's who I would have picked if we could pick a starter. So I'll just go – I'll go into the weeds here and go Jazzy and Patterson. Mm-hmm. I think at some point this year, you know, Iowa's going to have to, you know, run through its running backs. They're going to run the ball probably a lot. I just think he looks the part to me. I think he looks fantastic. I think Kirk's even mm-hmm. – even in Kirk's comments, I feel like you detect, like, they like this guy a lot. And I know Caleb Johnson's uh, – you know, he could be the – you know, almost like a Sean Green type of bell cow potentially if he stays healthy. But and I like Lee Sean Williams too. But mm-hmm. you know, we're those guys both started, so I can't pick them. So <laughs> Jazzy and Patterson, um, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I do remember back when Sean Green was was doing his thing that Jewel Hampton had I think seven touchdowns. Yeah, you know, as a right. backup. So I could see that. And now Jewel was more talented than 
LaShawn and probably, well, Jazz is different in, in style. I think they could be a really good one-two punch. So I'm there with you. And and one, one other guy I'm going to throw out there, and this is kind of the under, under the radar that I think is going to have an impact on this team. And I'm going to go with uh, Deshaun Lee. When I saw him kids yeah. day, I thought, good player. Um, mm-hmm. We've seen corners get hurt a lot. I think he might come in, and I was very impressed with him on Kids Day. So I think he's one that you might see um, at some point this year and make a difference. Yeah, and uh, we mentioned Brian Allen earlier in the show. I'm, yeah. He he lined up – did you notice this, Scott? He lined up inside a few times on Kids mm-hmm. Day. So I just wonder uh, – I kind of wrote this. It'll be online tomorrow. But uh, could he be in that Van Ness type of role where they just they just throw him out there on pass downs and say, go get him? And they might line them up inside. They might line them up outside. And uh, maybe that's kind of the role that Brian Allen has early in his Hawkeye career, where he doesn't have to worry about stopping the run as much. Just go get the freaking quarterback. Uh, all right, we got to wrap up. Chauncey yeah. Golston. Chauncey yeah. Golston. Yeah. That's what he reminds me of. Yeah. Uh, we got to wrap up, Scott, but uh, tell the folks what you're working on. I know there's a really, you got a great piece out on the athletic about uh, metrics on the offense. Yeah, I went through a lot of the different scenarios. I, I, I plugged six primarily, three that I thought were more schematic based, three that I thought were personnel based on how I was going to be judged this year. And I think uh, when you look at jet sweep motion, you know, the numbers behind it have been really, really good. How is Iowa going to counter and make that better and permanent? Um, I, red zone lack thereof production. It was terrible. And how do they make that better? Uh, then you look at offensive line. And I really used a comparison with 2007, Chad. Um, the 2017 team gave up 46 sacks and didn't run the ball very well. But they had a lot of really good young talent that was just – I remember Kirk saying this phrase, and it always stuck with me that year, which was, I can work with these guys. And it was like Julian Vandervelde. It was a true freshman, Brian Bulaga. And they struggled all year. And Jake Christensen struggled at quarterback. Next year – Sean Green, you know, Doak Walker Award winner. By the end of the year, they were, they were like a, a hammer, and and so that that's kind of what I looked at there. And then and I threw out something really really crazy that just published on uh, basketball in the Big Ten. So I hope everybody kind of takes a look at it and either rolls their eyes or decides, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Right. I like it. You've always got good ideas, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, like I mentioned, um, yeah. uh, Beth gets interview on Hawk Central on Wednesday night. Uh, kind of really enjoyed that conversation. So circling back to something we talked about earlier, uh, defensive line piece I mentioned, and also uh, coming later in the week, you know, Scott, Iowa has no backup kicker and really no backup punter right now with Aaron Blom's uh, status pretty much. I mean, I I can't imagine he's playing this year. So uh, they got to stay healthy, Torrey Taylor and Drew Stevens uh, (laughs) this year. So I'm going to delve into that a little bit uh, more, kind of get deeper into the weeds on, how you manage that reps wise, that type of thing. So good show, man. I, I felt like episode two was, was pretty solid. I'm I'll, I'll put it right up there with one. Yeah. I think uh, they're, they're like the Spider-Man meme of them both looking <laughs> at each other and pointing. So <laughs> look forward to next week and maybe we'll get, you know, three Spider-Men in one, one shot. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, looks like we kind of went a little over a 45 minute target, but not too far. So uh, I wanted to tell folks from now on, we will be joining you every Thursday from the Channel Seed Studios during the season because that uh, we will start that routine on game week. And next week is game week. So uh, Hawkeyes facing Utah State. Uh, wow, just, uh, what, 12 days away now, Scott. That's crazy. Uh, so anyway, for Scott Docterman, this is Chad Leistico uh, of the Des Moines Register saying so long and catch you next Thursday on Legend and Legends and Listeners right here on the Iowa Everywhere Network.